it's not strange being interviewed because I, I obviously uh, do lots of interviews. Um, but it's a little strange being interviewed by you, Megan. <laughs> but there we are. <laughs> Let's see where we go. Well, and, you know, I also just I want to give you credit because I don't know if anybody that's attending has ever written a book, but writing a book is hard. And so I, I just want to say congratulations. Um, it's a labor of love. And I'm really, you know, I'm proud of you. And and this book, it's so clear that everything leading in your life up to the publication of this book was how it was just really clear how every moment leading up to it, all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all the guidance that you poured into it is it's like the culmination of your life's experiences and all of the conversations and interviews that you've had with experts, as well as all of the people that you've, um, you know, been in relationship with as a, as a therapist and then personally as well. So congratulations, Alex. Thank you. I have to say it was quite sweet when we spoke a few weeks ago and you, and you were like, I'm really relieved. And I was like, why are you like, cause I like the book. Cause this could be a little <laughs> awkward otherwise. Right. <laughs> so. I mean, there's nothing worse than reading somebody's book and you're just like, wow, this is the, you wrote a book. All right. <laughs> um, but this one's actually quite good. So I'm really, I'm proud to interview you about it because I really do think that people are going to benefit from it. And it'll be one of those books that stays in my, my sacred spot in the back that I refer to all. So for people who aren't familiar with your work, I would love it if you could start by giving us a brief background on your history and what experiences have led you to this point and why you wanted to write a book now. Well, my interest and appetite in self-development, in health and trauma, I think like a lot of people, a lot of the experts that we interview in, in this world, um, was because of my own misery and suffering and and trying to find pathways um, through that. And so I suffered from my mid-teens to my early 20s from uh, a complex chronic illness, um, ME or chronic fatigue syndrome, or um, has many confusing and conflicting names. Um, and on the other side of that, I really set up the clinic that I'd wanted to exist in the years that, that I'd been ill. And I was very proud of that. And that clinic became very successful um, in my sort of um, mid 20s. And then I relatively quickly realized, and this is really where the first chapter of, of, of the book starts, that I'd been on a physical healing journey. And in some ways, I'd been on a psycho emotional healing journey. But I really hadn't been on a on a on a proper trauma healing journey. And I'd understood a lot of things in my mind and in perspectives and so on. But I was utterly unable to feel my own feelings and emotions. And at that time, as I write about, say, in the first chapter, I was suffering from debilitating anxiety and panic attacks. I couldn't have a, I couldn't stay in a relationship longer than about about three months, despite the fact that I longed to be in a, in a lasting relationship. Um, and really, my whole life started to go into a kind of into a, a meltdown. And this was particularly awkward by the fact that I earned my living as a therapist and as, as, as a practitioner. And a lot of the issues that other people were coming to me for were the, some of the same issues that I was then starting to really struggle with. And what I really what I realized was the methods and the and the the ways that I was working as a clinician at that time were great for changing habits and um, challenging beliefs and um, dealing with unhelpful sort of patterns of thinking and behavior. But like a lot of approaches, I've done a very nifty job of circumnavigating, actually dealing with my feelings and, and my emotions. And I came to realize that the debilitating panic and anxiety that I was experiencing at that time was really my... Uh, nervous system's way of trying to get away from all of these feelings and all of these emotions. And fairly quickly um, then came to realize that I had, like many of us do, I don't think I'm in any way unique in this, but I had some significant childhood events that had shaped my, my life. And one of those was my father leaving soon after I was born. And the second of which was my sister having very severe um, mental health issues that created a lot of volatility and um, and at times danger in the in the environment that I grew up in. And so, at this point in my mid twenties, I um, I went on a very intense emotional healing journey. Um, I think I attended about thirty five week long retreats over about a sort of 
um, five, 10 year period, um, read tons of books, did many, many hours of what, personal therapy and so on. And, and in a way, I, I didn't realize it at the time. And at the time, the word trauma wasn't in the kind of, wasn't really even in therapeutic circle if we weren't using the, this kind of vocabulary. Um, it was kind of, we talk about doing emotional healing or sort of, you know, going to the dark places and dealing with your difficult stuff. Um, but what I was really doing, I, re I realized in hindsight was, yes, I was on a healing journey, but I was also figuring out the missing pieces in the frameworks that I was working with to work with 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 my patients and and through the optimal health clinic and also our practitioner training and therapeutic coaching at that time i realized was half complete and there was this whole other piece around working with emotions and trauma and and how healing needs to happen not just cognitively but it has to happen on a much deeper level absolutely yeah and it's interesting too to reflect on and I think it's such a great point that you make that, you know, it was only about 10 years ago that trauma outside of the acute, you know, diagnostic and statistical manual that psychologists use in the States. And I can't remember what it's called there in Europe, but it, it's you know, the, yeah. is it? Yeah. Um, the, the DSM definitions of trauma expanded outward and the things like the ACEs study um, for adverse childhood experiences and things that they they started to really talk in psychological circles about what the extensive experiences of trauma could be. Um, and I think yours were not really that grave an area, but and we'll get into that soon. But um, so it, it's not for nothing that none of us knew we had trauma, right? Well, like, I, so I remember in a, around... 13 or 14 years ago. So Anna Dashinsky, who I, I know that obviously you know, who um, co-leads our therapeutic coaching practitioner training with me. She was like, oh, I'm thinking of doing a, doing a master's degree um, on trauma. And I was like, what? Because <laughs> to all of us, or not, but many of us at that time, trauma was PTSD type trauma. It wasn't the more, um, and we can, I'm sure we can get into this in a minute, but the more subtle traumas that, that we all experience. And even three years ago when we did the first trauma super conference, I remember I wanted to call it the trauma and in fact, it was called the trauma and mind body super conference. And it was in that process that I realized that I'd spent at that point, 17 years of my clinical career, working with trauma, calling it many different other things. And I think we all have a lot um, to thank some of the people that you know, you and I have had the great privilege of interviewing for the amazing work they've done over recent decades to bring trauma to to the mainstream in, with the vocabulary and understanding they have done. Absolutely. And so, other than you know digging up our past, I really want to talk about the point of healing your trauma. Like, what's on the other side, and then let's back into all the ways in which your book is great in dealing with that. But really, what I want to outline for people is. What's at stake and why do we even want to go in there? Great question. Um, you know, in a way, well, firstly, it's moving away from suffering and our unresolved and unhealed suffering is pretty miserable. I mean, it causes an enormous amount of pain in our lives. But it's not just that, because I think sometimes what happens is people almost inevitably come to therapeutic work to get out of pain. They want to end the, the, the physical or emotional suffering that they experience. But to me, it's more than that. It's also unlocking our true potential or awakening our true potential in, in our lives. And in a way, this is something that's been really changing in some of my own vocabulary and thinking about this more recently, that, you know, being very mindful that we know that we name our conferences anxiety super conference, trauma super conference, sleep super conference, because we know that it's the pain point that brings people to, to, to this work. But to really live our true potential in our lives, we need to be able to be free of that stuff. And if that's our, you know, when I say potential, yes, that can mean potential in terms of our, our career and ambitions and so on. But to me, that's not the most important part of it. It's potential in terms of our intimate relationships and our family and our friendships to, to not just sort of survive in relationship, but to feel the depth of love and connection and intimacy 
that requires an openness and vulnerability that's almost impossible to do when we've got layers of guarding and protection to protect us from, from a world that we've learned to be afraid of. I did not give that question to Alex earlier and you, you did great. That oh, was an excellent you. answer. Thank you. <laughs> it's exactly what I was looking for. And we didn't even, I didn't even give you that one ahead of time. Um, all right. So now that we know why we're doing the work is completely in alignment with that answer. You're absolutely right. That's, that's why we do the whole thing. And I wish the marketing did not work in the way that it does. Right. I wish we didn't have to give people the problem we're trying to solve. I wish we could give them the potential we're trying to give them as the marketing tool. Right. But instead we have to sell the problems, not the solutions. Um, so that's why we call it the trauma super conference. And you know, that's why we market books the way we do. But um, so speaking of the book, it's really well formatted to give people the framework with which to heal their trauma. And you share a lot of deeply personal information and about your life within the pages. And a lot of it was even new to me. And I feel like I know you pretty well. So why did you decide to share those particular aspects of your life in this book in particular? Well, firstly, I wrestled with it a lot. Um, when I, when I, uh, so I, when I agreed the publishing deal on this book, it was after my book on on fatigue, um, which came out two years ago. And the obvious thing for me to do, having interviewed, as you have done, hundreds of the world's experts on trauma, was to write a book that was a synthesis, to sort of pull together the best of all of the different frameworks and, and models and so on. Or the other idea, which and all of these things have influenced a book, was to write a book as a, you know, 20 years working as a clinician, having worked with thousands of people directly, indirectly, you know, we have a team of 25 full-time practitioners in the Optum Health Clinic, and I have all the sort of insight that, that comes from that as well. But as I started to write the book, what I realized was I was asking the, the reader to go on a deeply vulnerable and intimate and personal journey and my way of teaching over the years has always been to try to lead from the front and to go, well, I'm not going to ask you to go anywhere that I'm not willing to go myself. And so as I was writing the book, I was reflecting on the journey that I'd been on to find the clarity and, 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 and hopefully wisdom that, that's there in the book. And I was reflecting on some of the personal stories and experiences. And then as I started to write those pieces, that was where, for me, the real energy came in as, as, as a writer, partly because 20 years ago, I wrote an autobiographical book of my recovery from ME chronic fatigue syndrome, and there's nothing more cathartic than writing your own story. Um, you know, and uh, to be clear, probably only, I don't know, less than 10% of the actual words in the book is, is my personal narrative. It's not a memoir. It's not a kind of personal narrative book. But I felt there were certain places that, the most powerful way for me as a writer to bring it to life was was to share those experiences um and it isn't it you know i i do feel genuinely at the edges of my own comfort zone about some of the stuff that that's in the book um everything that i write about which is deeply personal is is mostly at least a decade old some of it is 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 not quite that um so it's not, it felt okay in a way, because it's not the stuff, it's not cooking in me now. It's stuff that I feel that I've, I've, I've moved through, but you know, I had a funny experience um, a couple of weeks ago when we dropped the, the, the kind of cinematic version of the trailer for the book, because one of my, in fact, you, you know, so Nadia, who, who ran our, the training that we, we did, we did in, um, for the leadership team uh, last year, um, was one of my, my, probably my closest friend when I was at university and she, I sent her the trailer and she sent me a WhatsApp straight back going, what, you met your dad? What happened? Because <laughs> like, she remembered me at university when that was like a really alive, alive thing. Um, so there's things in, there's some things in here that I, I haven't certainly haven't shared publicly and certainly um, for me are very vulnerable things. But I just felt that if the reader is respecting and trusting me with their heart in, 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 in buying and reading the book, that I wanted to meet them in that place. And that, that, that was my intention in it. Yeah, absolutely. And I know personally for me, I have a lot more respect for writers and experts that give me a process that they've also been through, that they've engaged. I just trust them more and I trust the process more, especially if they reveal the ways in which it was difficult. Like this is my process, 
I've done it and it wasn't a cakewalk. <laughs> here's, yeah. here's what you can expect. Here's how you might struggle. And that was really what I found in these pages. It was like, here's the guide. I've also done it. I'm going to walk hand in hand with you through the process. And it's, it might not be pretty, but the relief on the other side or the the freedom on the other side, or, you know, the, the healing on the other side will be there. And so, yes. Um, yeah. And, and it's interesting, you know, so the, without wanting to give away all of the details, cause I don't want, it's a bit like the way that I wrote the book was, you know, it, it's a, ultimately it's a, it's a practical self-help um, book, um, but it does bookend with, my own trauma, and then the resolution of the trauma. Um, and, you know, so in the in the last chapter, I talk about where I eventually, um, almost exactly, almost literally exactly about 10 years ago, met my father, and that I hadn't met since I, you know, I hadn't met, I'd left when I was, was a um, few months old. And it didn't go well. <laughs> it was a very, very, very painful, ultimately very painful experience. Um, and that's the end of the book. Of course, the point is that what I what I learned from that was I could re-experience the same event, but the second time not be traumatized by the event. But I felt it was important to share because I could have I could have stopped the the book with the happy bit of the story, but it felt important to me to make the point that most of our lives are not like Hollywood movies. Most of our lives don't have the perfect magical disney ending they have difficulty and challenge and and for the book to really mean something to me the the learnings within it have to help us navigate that not just try to create the the perfect ending and live happily ever after because that's certainly not been my experience of life yeah and we're certainly uh not living our lives in a way that make for happy endings and books. That's not, it's not life. We're not living like, all oh, this will make a great end of the book that I haven't thought of yet. <laughs> um, and so, and one of the things that I really want people to know is that you don't shy away from um, the raw emotions that you were feeling, right? You weren't like, I was sad. You're There's like rage and all of these <laughs> things that we don't, um, we don't give a lot of airtime to, frankly, you know, we talk about grief and we talk about sadness and like emotions are hard for people. And you're really raw about some emotions that you had um, in this experience. And while I couldn't directly relate to them, having not experienced that particular thing yet, I have, I am in close relationship with someone who was going through those emotions. And so it was really um, helpful for me to, to feel that through what you were describing. And so, yeah, the whole range of emotions. We'll get to that question in a second. Yeah, well, um, okay, if, I, if I could just, I, I want to say something. Yeah. Now that's okay. So the if we track back to, again, this is sort of where, the, where, where the book starts, that I'm having these very severe anxiety attacks. I'm not capable of having intimate relationship because as soon as I get close to someone, I, 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 I then run away. That I realized, I was helped to realize through the therapeutic work I was doing at the time, that I had basically two choices. I had the choice of continuing the way that I was, and that was just a, an endless life of suffering, or I was going to have to turn towards the feelings and the emotions that I spent my, my life up until that point trying to escape and trying to get away from. But turning towards those emotions felt like, literally, it, it wasn't didn't metaphorically feel like, it actually felt like death. It felt like I, I, I was dying. And the... The f the first often emotions are like, are like layers of, of of an onion, and the the surface emotion was hate. It wasn't you know it wasn't anger and rage. It was murderous hate, and it was the hate of my father for abandoning and leaving me as a child. And it wasn't that I kind of metaphorically wanted to kill him. I physically embodied in my body wanted to murder him, and and I wanted it, and so. Being enabled and supported to fully experience that hatred and to be able to release the energy of that hatred was one of the most transformational experiences in, in, in my life. Um, of course, underneath the hatred, that wasn't the end of it, underneath the hatred was a desperate sadness and longing and wanting of, of, of my father. And underneath that was a very deep sense of love and connectedness and freedom and, and, and liberation. Um, 
And after I'd had that therapeutic experience, I then spent six months of my life, pretty much, I mean, I, I don't know to the day, but roughly six months of my life feeling anger and hate pretty much every day. It's like this backlog of stuff that just hadn't been felt and hadn't been owned. Um, and then after six months of that, I spent another six months just feeling sad and just crying a lot. And, um, you know, I'd be at Shavasana at the end of a yoga class, you know, often we kind of, we, we kind of have, feel more spacious. And I just start, start crying, which was, as a 27-year-old man, rather embarrassing. But it it was, it, and so to answer your question in terms of, of, of the writing of the book, one of the things that felt very important to me was that I feel a lot of the literature around emotional healing and 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 trauma work is either quite theoretical it's kind of talking about things or it all sounds a bit neat and tidy like you feel your emotions and you release them and so on and when i was going through my experience because as someone that had read a lot of that literature it didn't speak to my experience. And so I felt at the time there was something wrong with me or I wasn't doing it right or I was more screwed up than most people or why was I still feeling, feeling hate and rage six months after I'd first started accessing it. And so I, I, it felt very important to me to write the book in a way that would hopefully normalize people's experience. It's not to say everyone has to feel angry for six months or sad for six months. It's just That was just my experience. But the to truly do our to truly do our trauma healing work we don't have to go back and re-experience everything but we do have to move what's held and stored in 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 our body and yeah and i, I wanted to speak to that in as honest and as direct way as 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 i could and you did a great job of that i mean it really i think it's going to help a lot of people who are feeling alone in the 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 great amount of feeling that they're feeling. And one of my questions was, what are people afraid of when they won't allow themselves to feel their feelings? And I think we've answered that, right? Like, we it's smart. We we are intelligent beings, and we don't want to feel our feelings because we know what we're going to unleash. But what's being blocked by that lack of emotion or that armor of hatred, actually, as you I think you named it in your book? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny, when I did the first the first few edits of the book, I realized there was a metaphor that I'd massively overused and had to had to kind of work it out, remove it from a bunch of places. Um, but the metaphor was that the walls that we build to keep us safe as children become the walls of the prison that trap us is an, it, it, later in our life. And so for me, the the basic strategy was these feelings are not held they're too difficult and also the other piece i should say that was important to me was i had my my sister was incredibly um emotionally volatile and so she suffered from a number of different um mental health issues um, and still does unfortunately um and would be would be violent physically destructive would self harm would all these things that happen and so what i witnessed was when people feel and express emotions, people get hurt. Particularly I get hurt, but also other people get hurt. And so I knew two ways to deal with emotion. One was this very volatile, dangerous expression of emotion. And the other was just this total emotional shutdown and not feeling and speeding up and going into my mind to, to escape those emotions. And so to, 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 to find our way sort of out of, of 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 the maze of this what we have to learn is there's another way and that other way is that we have to we have to and this is one of the big themes of the book but that we all have effectively three core emotional needs and when they're not met well for us as children we don't learn how to meet them for ourselves as adults and these emotional needs allow us to feel and process our emotions and so to put to take down the walls of the prison that trapped us, that kept us safe and now trapped us, we have to then learn how to meet those core emotional needs. And that, that to me was a big part of my healing journey, but also it's been a very big part of my work as a practitioner over recent years about how do we effectively become the holding healing environment that we probably didn't have for ourselves in our lives now. Absolutely. And I know that you have kind of a tool and a technique that we're going to get to in a second, but I want people to know that we're going to get there, but I have a couple more follow-up questions before we get to that. 
Um, and one of them is it, you reminded me as you were speaking about, you know, the difference between safety and discomfort on a healing journey, right? And when you've been fundamentally unsafe, whether that be physically or emotionally, especially in your um, environment of upbringing, then feelings and environments and relationships can feel unsafe. But as we're healing, we've got to learn that difference between safety and discomfort. So how do we how does your book address that? And how do you talk about that? Pretty much my opening remark on every in-person event that we do, be it a weekend, be it a practitioner training, is this, you know, this weekend or this week, whatever, you should always be safe. Doesn't mean you'll always feel safe, but you should always be safe, but you should not always feel comfortable. Because discomfort is often a sign that things are different or things are changing. Or not, perhaps maybe a slightly better word substitute is familiar. They shouldn't always feel the same. Because when things feel unfamiliar or we feel uncomfortable or outside of our comfort zone, that means things are changing. But when we put together comfort and um, consistency and the sameness and safety, whenever anything's different, then that must mean that we're unsafe. And so one of the most important things I think we all of us have to learn as part of our inner work is how do we build a state of inner safety? How can we build safety in our nervous system, which is not dependent upon everyone around us? So as children, our safety is entirely dependent upon the world around us. One of the differences between being a child and an adult is we can learn to meet our core emotional needs. But if we can feel safe, and we can build safety, that allows us then to start to feel and process those feelings and emotions that otherwise we may be rejecting, shutting down and, and trying to escape from. Absolutely. You make a great point. And you mentioned the nervous system. And I don't want to brush over that because there's a ton of great stuff about nervous system education. And it, I would be remiss if I didn't bring to the point what we we've said this many times, but Having a regulated nervous system does not mean you are always in a state of calm and bliss and <laughs> homeostasis, right? Are you referring to the fact that I'm not always calm and in a state of, state of bliss all the time? I, I was not at all <laughs> directing this at you. I think we just, you know, the this self-help world, if you will, has, we talk a lot about the nervous system and I'm so glad people are talking about it because so many people are unaware of their nervous system existing, what its role is, what you're in control of, what you're not in control of. Um, and I think that we have have minimized that in trying to get people talking about it and understanding it into like a regulated nervous system means that you're just like unflustered by life. And as you and I have talked about in several times in interviews and several conversations, like a regulated nervous system means you respond appropriately to what's happening and then you can get back to calm, yeah. right? Yeah. So I one of the really um powerful uh, laboratories in my own learning over the years has been working with complex chronic illnesses for, for you know 20 years now. And one of the really important distinctions that we've made in that body of work is between exactly what you're saying, a healthy stress response and a maladaptive stress response. So a healthy stress response is you and I are doing a live interview in, in front of a bunch of people. I my system is on. <laughs> I, I don't feel I don't feel anxious and I don't feel hyper and I don't my mind isn't racing, but I'm paying attention. I hope I'm paying attention. Right. That's different to the state that I'm going to be in in an hour's time when I'm driving home from work, where my systems I still need to be on because I'm driving a car, but it's it's going to be a different state. The maladaptive stress response is when our nervous system is responding in a maladaptive way, when it becomes unhealthily dysregulated so to explain that a bit more healthy stress response you know you and i are walking down the street together in london as we often are caught up in conversation not particularly paying attention don't see this is worse now with electric buses don't see the big red electric london bus that you can't hear it coming right you can't hear it coming <laughs> and so one of us catches it grabs the other one and we leap onto the pavement or sidewalk as you would call it and in that in that state we need a massive hit of adrenaline and cortisol to respond to the threat. And it's probably going to take 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes for, our, for those chemicals to come out of our bloodstream for our system then to return back to a state of normal. 
Same thing as thousands of years ago, we're walking along, we don't see the saber-toothed tiger, it leaps out, we're going to fight, flight, freeze, and, 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 and hopefully survive that situation. The problem is that when we experience trauma that's overwhelming, and when we experience events that dysregulate our nervous system, and we don't find our way back to safety, we, over time, we normalize to a state of dysregulation. So if this is our, visually, if this is our homeostasis and we see the bus and we go up and it comes back down again, if we go up so many times, after a while, our system and its great wisdom goes, well, that must be the new normal. Because the threat's always there, the bus is always hunting us and chasing us, we need to be in that state of activation. So that's what we call a maladaptive stress response. And that has massive impacts on so the origins of a lot of my work around physical health but when people go into a maladaptive stress response their body is in the exact opposite state it needs to be to heal so calming that stress response is really important for physical healing but then i realized um over the years the same thing is true for emotional healing that for our system to be able to metabolize to process to digest our emotional trauma we have to be in a safe, calm, healing state. And so you, uh, this is where sequencing of intervention becomes very, very important. In the, in the second section of the book, I talk about my reset framework. And one of the things that's really important in this is we have to build some safety and calming and some tools to settle our nervous system before we can do our emotional healing work. Same principle, physical healing for emotional healing. and so. To go back, and I think I'm going to jump into your next question here, if that's okay. But but, but yeah, go, go ahead. Back, trauma is not. There's so much talk about trauma, the events of trauma, and you know, you mentioned earlier adverse childhood experiences, and one of the points I labour quite strongly, I think it's in chapter three in the book, is that yes, there's those overt traumas or what people used to call big T traumas. I'm not such a fan of that because I think it negates the other experiences that we have what I call in the book covert traumas, like these more subtle experiences that are not necessarily being physically or sexually abused or having a parent incarcerated or, or whatever. But it's the day that you come home from school and you were laughed at in the classroom and what you needed was to be held and, and nurtured and your parents were very busy and they rewarded you for being a grown-up and dealing with your emotions, basically not dealing with your emotions and shutting down. And over time, we learn those as our ways of, 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 of being in the world. So there's the events, of overt events, but also more subtle covert events. And this is the in the first part of the book, what I call the echo framework. So there's the events, but we can have people experience the same events and have very different outcomes. And so the context within which the event happens is incredibly important. And that goes back to what we've been touching on through this interview around we all have three core emotional needs. We talked about safety. That's one of the, the core emotional needs. There's also the need for boundaries, the ability to say, say yes, please, or no to other people, but also to ourselves. Then there's a the need for love. And it's not love for what we do. It's love for who we are. It's that state of feeling deeply loved by our caregivers for who we are as we are. And then that sets up a relationship with ourselves where we then learn to accept and love ourselves as we are. And then our life doesn't become about all the things we have to do to be able to then receive a state of love. So there's the events, there's the context, that's whether our core emotional needs are met of boundary, safety, and love. And if they're not, this is then the piece we were just talking about. This is the H of echo, so events, context, um, homeostasis, there is a homeostatic shift in our nervous system. And then our nervous system becomes dysregulated and we become normalized to being in a state of anxiety or freeze or um, constantly being on the go or whatever it may be. The O of echo, which in a way I think to me is one of the things I'm, I'm really trying to amplify the understanding of because I think it's a missing piece in some of the, the trauma work, is there's then the outcomes in our lives. Living with a dysregulated nervous system is very difficult. So we have to find ways to manage that. Maybe we manage that through addiction, 
That might be alcohol, it might be drugs, it might be sex, whatever it may be, but trying to constantly change how our nervous system feels. Or we, like I did, we get normalized to a state of anxiety and we manage that by always being busy or always trying to distract away from it. Or the outcome is that we become emotionally numb and we become depressed and we can't feel the richness and the joy of, of life. These outcomes are symptoms of a dysregulated nervous system. And the problem is, in, in my humble opinion, that much of the work that's done in therapeutic circles is to treat these symptoms. Just like in the medical world, a lot of the work is to treat people's symptoms rather than to look at the cause of the symptoms. The cause of many of the symptoms we experience psycho-emotionally is a dysregulated nervous system. The homeostasis has, has been moved, which is the result of our core emotional needs not being met and the, then the, the trauma experiences that we had. And so a really big um, focus within the book is how do we reset that dysregulated nervous system and how do we learn to meet those core emotional needs? Yeah, absolutely. And talking about treating outcomes, it's, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for the therapeutic environment and the medical environment for that matter and um, getting people resourced, getting them relief, getting them um, a little bit of purchase <laughs> outside of what brought them in is so, so important. But then totally. once we get people into a state of safety, or a, a state of just having a little bit more reserve than they did when they came back in, um, then we got to start doing a little bit of the the slower, deeper yeah. emotional work, right? I, I, I always like to make the point, I'm a really big fan of modern medicine. I'm a really big fan of painkillers. Like I get hit by that bus that you and I didn't get out of the way of. And it, yeah. it injures me like, give me the fucking painkillers, please. Like I think antidepressants used responsibly and appropriately save many, many, many people's lives. They just don't deal with the underlying issues. So managing symptoms is one of the gifts of modern medicine. You know, it's like, who goes to the dentist and goes, I'm going to go natural, thanks. Don't, don't give me the bank in this. Like, absolutely, symptom management has its place. But exactly as you say, it's not the whole jigsaw. And if we make it the whole jigsaw, we just go round and round spinning our wheels and, and our suffering cycle of suffering just continues. Absolutely. Uh, but kind of wrapping this up and talking about context it's important for us to feel our feelings, but we don't want to sway completely the other way. And we're just like a walking op open emotional wound all the time. So how do we find that middle ground between being closed off and avoidant or a complete mess when we start our healing journey? I don't know if I can provide perfect guidance on how not to become a mess at the start. <laughs> right, right. So, so, sometimes it's a little bit like a pendulum that swung too far one way and it has to overswing to find that point of balance. But what I will say is it doesn't, it's rarely as messy as we think it's going to be. So the narrative that we have, so go back to what I was sharing a little bit earlier. And I said, it wasn't that I had an anxiety that I was going to die. I literally felt like I as I was going into those emotions initially, like there was a bottomless abyss that I was going to fall into and I was never going to survive and it was going to engulf me. That was the, the very real visceral felt sense of, of the experience. You know, going back, I said something I said earlier about sequencing of intervention. So I'm going to map again. I've, I've done this a few times. But I'm going to map again to, to, to working with chronic illnesses. We have people come in saying, I want to do this, um, this detox protocol because I've got heavy metals or I've got um, mold or so on. And we'll look at the case and we'll go, your system is not resilient enough right now to do that detox. We need to spend three months, four months, whatever, building up your system to be strong enough to then be able to do the detox, which may well be a very key part of the healing work. So responsible therapeutic work is not session one, everyone needs to go straight into their biggest emotional traumas. Responsible therapeutic work is building up the foundations, the scaffolding, effectively learning to meet those core emotional needs. Now, a therapist may, may mirror and model that in, in, in ways, but the critical thing is the client or the patient learns to do that for themselves. And so as we learn to, for example, meet our needs for boundaries, 
we also can say yes and no to ourselves and other people. And so there are times where, you know, I remember I used to have this experience. I'd come back off, um, I mentioned that a lot, a lot of retreats. So I'd come back off a week-long retreat and I'd gone really deep into my emotional world. And I'd get back like on a Sunday night and then Monday morning, I'd be sat at my desk in the office and I sit at my desk and I burst into tears and I'd be like, I can't deal with this. And then inevitably, I'd go for a few meetings and by two o'clock in the afternoon, I was armored back up and then I could function fine. And a part of me, my inner critic would be, oh my God, you know, you're so defensive, you're shutting things down. But that's what I needed to do to function and it's okay. Like it, it doesn't, it's not a, a binary, you're feeling all of your feelings, you're feeling none of them at all. And I always want to remind people, those defenses you spent your whole life mastering, you don't lose the ability to use them, right? Maybe you want to, but those walls you've built up, it's not like you get a um, bazooka and just blow them all down. So yeah, you may really open up in a therapy session or you know, reading a book or doing an online course or doing a workshop or whatever. But that ability to reconstruct your, your defensive strategies won't be lost. You're not losing choices. What you're doing is you're adding choices. So the narrative we can have is that I will be annihilated, demolished, I will never survive this. That is categorically not the truth. And it can take some time. And that's where being uh, well-resourced, being well-supported, being able to ask for help um, is really important. You know, And one of the things I talk about in the book as well, which I also feel is, in a way, an, an underemphasized piece is, and it's interesting for you and I in the context of, of an interview, um, is friendship. Like I can think of times in our friendship where one of us has been in a painful and difficult place. And it's coming to the other one, not the last thing we want is to be fixed or the answer. It's having someone that can see us, meet us, hold us in that place that makes us feel less alone, makes us feel honored in, in, in where we are. And I think a lot of us go on, when we start this inner work, we can feel very alone in that process because everyone in our life knows us the way we were before and still wants to relate to us in that way. So building that support and those friendships and those connections, and that can take a long time sometimes to do, but that's also really important that we're not, it's not just us and our therapist. Like we need to, yeah, to, to build that holding in, in our external life as well. Although it can start with just you and your therapist. <laughs> yeah, totally. It nearly always starts <laughs> like, with just you. And that's then how mine did. Yeah. And then it did. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, you said a lot there, and I want to circle back to a couple of things. And you and I have been talking in the last couple of weeks about this curiosity I've had around psychology versus biology, right? And I think sometimes in the self-help world and um, therapy world and trauma healing world, um, we can give ourselves the impression that we're completely solely responsible for all of this stuff and that it's all under our control, right? Mm -hmm. And if we go back to what you were saying about, um, and what I've heard several people, I think it was Gabor, uh, talking about trauma in the context of um, too much too soon without, you know, somebody to protect us. Um, if we're doing that to ourselves, right, if we're if we're just like intensely, like, I'm going to unpack all this stuff and just be an emotional mess, like, then we're giving ourselves too much too soon without that context, right? Yeah. And not and emotionally, you know, being cognizant of what we can handle. You know, I think what's also something that's, I, I, I'm pretty sure this is in the book. I'm just trying to remember where I put it. Um, but one of the things that, if it's not, I'll get it in the revised edition. But one of the things that really has been on my mind in recent time is inevitably what we do is the place that we meet our trauma healing journey from, or the place we try to guide it from, is the traumatized place that needs to be healed. Right. And so for me, it, you know, one of my trauma survival strategies was to go into a, a very um, uh, driven achiever pattern. So it's like, if I can just become successful enough, then people will love me, then I'll feel safe, and then I'll be have enough power to be able to have the boundaries and, and so on that I need. So trying to meet my core emotional needs by, by that success. So when I started my trauma healing journey, do you think I was kind and generous towards myself? It was like, how hard, how fast? I'm going to grind quickly. this right. out. 
I'm it's gonna like, be the best trauma healer ever. Yeah. Right. It's like it's like in that in those particular couple of years where I was really active in 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 that work. I think I I read, and this will still be lost on some people, but you'll get this. I think I read three quarters of the collective works of Ken Wilber, for example, in two years, just so I could really understand what, what was what was going on. Amazing work, but a little obsessive in, in terms of my my engagement with it. Um, so one of the things that I really encourage people with is if the way that we meet our trauma healing is one of gentleness and self-care and good healthy boundaries that is the healing in of itself you may have outdated crappy techniques and strategies and so on but if the way that you apply those is from a place of gentleness and kindness and you're breaking the cycle of what happened that alone is the healing work and so be very mindful of the way you're approaching your healing and changing that alone, that in of itself can be the healing. So I'm going to give one final shameless plug and then I'm going to promise you that- Share the book. We, that we won't, inter Megan won't interview me for at least two years until my next book potentially comes out. So that, <laughs> that, 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 that's the deal. Um, so my book, It's Not Your Fault, Why Childhood Trauma Shapes You and How to Break Free. It's on pre-order now. Um, if you're thinking of ordering a copy, two things I'd say. One, it really helps if you order now because pre-orders tell the wherever you order it from and it's available in all the places, obviously Amazon being the best known. It tells those platforms people like the book and then it pushes it and more people buy it. Um, and secondly, if you then go to my website, alexhoward.com and you click on books and you click on this book and you register your, um, your receipt, um, just the receipt number, you will then get access to a ton of additional stuff, including my Decode Your Trauma, Decode Your Nervous System, and Decode Your Fatigue video series. You'll get access to chapter one immediately, and also a chapter from the audio book immediately um, as well. That's my shameless plug over. I promise not to self-promote again in these sessions. Thank you so much, Alex. Congratulations again. I can't wait till my physical copy comes in the mail. I got an advanced, uh, you know, digital copy, but I'm looking forward to seeing it. And uh, good luck. Thanks, everybody, for being oh, with us today. Amazing. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you.